so I appreciate the opportunity. I'm Artie Merritt, uh, the head of growth from VoiceFlow and, and Brandon, um, the CEO of Skilled Creative. Maybe just real quickly, if you guys give a quick little background on yourselves. Um, I don't know, perhaps Brandon, if you want to go first. Sure. Yeah. Nice to, to be here. Thanks for having me and, and inviting me to the panel. Uh, I'm Brandon Kaplan. I'm the, the founder and CEO of Skilled Creative, and we are uh, a full service voice agency based in New York and in LA. And, and a full service voice agency is, is a new thing. Uh, but essentially what it means is that we work with, you know, fortune 500 brands, small, large, large size brands who are interested in voice, curious about voice. They know they want to build some type of a voice program. They may not know what the, what to do yet. And we help them anywhere from education, strategy, putting together a product roadmap to then executing on a pro, uh, on a program from building voice experiences, maintaining voice experiences, doing analytics, managing partnerships and relationships with the platform. So, so truly a, a full service voice agency, helping brands get into the into the voice space. And we work with people in the media entertainment space like Meredith Corporation, Warner Media, Warner Music, Nutella, PepsiCo, Pfizer, a um, bunch of different categories, but lo love voice. And that's why we're in it. Awesome. Um, I guess I will go. Uh, so hi, I'm Emily. Uh, I'm the head of growth at VoiceFlow. Um, I joined the company a little over two and a half years ago, first as their first advisor and then uh, full time to help grow out what has now become our community partnerships, marketing, product activation streams, all of the fun startup hats that one needs to wear at the beginning. Um, I, I've been in growth for the better part of the last seven years and in voice, um, I guess, for the better part of the last, I guess, three years. Um, and really what VoiceLow is and what we're trying to build is that go-to tool to make it easier for people to design, develop, and launch voice apps, whether it's for uh, already existing platforms like Alexa, Google, Magenta, uh, Bixby, or trying to do their own conversational AI. Um, and really what we've been able to do over the last few years is make that accessible, bring no code, low code availability to agencies, to teams, to individuals. And now we're working with over 66, thousand people around the world, as well as teams like Home Depot, McDonald's, BMW, um, things like that, to be able to power those devices. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah, you, you guys are both uh, the experts in the space. It's it's great to do this uh, with you, and it would be awesome to hear your insights and all. Um, just to get started, maybe we can, right from the beginning, just talk about why are enterprises and brands building voice experiences? What are some of the things that you all are seeing is working well or the reasons people are doing this? Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, you know, it's it's funny. We've, we've been in the space for a number of years from kind of like the, it's only a short while ago, but the infancy since, you know, Alexa just first came out and, um, you know, it started kind of as a novelty, but you know, some of the data that flies around, you know, voice is the it's the fastest growing digital channel ever, faster than the smartphone, right? And we have hundreds of millions of devices in homes and in cars and on phones, billions of devices when you count phones. And I think the brands and enterprises are recognizing that, you know, voice is not a, a shiny object. It's it's a user interface that's really going to be here for the long haul, and they they want to get ahead of it. So whether they're doing a test and learn or they're trying to put together a really robust program, uh, you know, the, the conversations we're having are, listen, we know that this is going to be a major piece of our business in the next three, five, 10 years. And, and we need to figure out how to start winning in it now so that we get ahead of our competition uh, and we start generating value for our consumers or our guests and stakeholders. And um, that's what we're seeing. People just kind of want to get ahead of the curve. Yeah, like I, I totally agree with Brandon. I think that some of the the best companies right now are are doing this a to to really try to make their existing IVRs or their existing voice experience smarter, but also get ahead so that they're going to be on the cutting edge of what is this new interface and what is this new way that we can interact with consumers, inspire people to take action, or even in a lot of cases, what we've also seen is people getting ahead of just a new way that we're going to interact with technology. Um, in the same way that the internet introduced new ways for us to browse and consume information, 
Um, the mobile device did that and made that more accessible and voice is that next layer where now there are people that were left behind from these previous interfaces that are getting ahead of that. And there are newer generations that are growing up with it. So people who are investing in it now are really learning those foundational stakes to be best in class and are doing all that innovative work that's gonna end up becoming table stakes when you start up a new business in the future. Yeah, that's fair. I remember uh, chatting with some folks on a panel before, um, and some, they were with a media company and they said they could read all these articles from say Gartner or whatnot about how these voice experiences are going, or they could just build one themselves and see it firsthand. Um, so they were, like you guys are mentioning, getting ahead of the curve. It's interesting because Google opened up nearly five years ago, like the end of 2016. Alexa's been open up, you know, before that. Um, where do you really, like, how do you guys feel about the voice space in, in general? Is it behind? Is it still ahead? Like, um, you know, where are these interfaces and experiences right now? Emily, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, yeah. sure. So, I personally think that um, it's so easy for people to latch onto and be like, ah, oh, like voice is just not where I want it to be right now because of sci-fi movies and because we're already adapted to other interfaces. But everyone forgets that slow crawl that happened with every previous interface. And then when you actually lay those on top of each other, voice to Brandon's point earlier is the fastest growing, the fastest growing platform and interface that we've seen in a really long time. Um, and while I think that there's a lot to be done on the NLP side and the NLU side, so how smart or how, um, how engaged the actual AIs can be in those interactions and also just a lot of improvement and discovery on, well, discoverability and education on the consumer side, I think there's a lot that needs to be done there. But that being said, I definitely don't feel like we're behind. I think that if anything, like now is one of the most exciting times to be in it, where I feel like we've kind of hit this turning point where on the consumer side, there's enough devices in the market, there's enough curiosity that's happening and enough conversation that it's really creating a bigger space for us to innovate in. And previously, I think that there was this rollout that we needed to make it a little bit more accessible where devices could actually benefit from this interface. And now that's included in all of the newer default devices. Yeah, I I, uh, I agree. There's a there's a quote that I really love. I think it was I think it was Bill Gates. He said, uh, "Like we always overestimate what we can do in a year, and we always underestimate what we can do in a decade." And I think that technology is always the same. It's like you know, technology comes out, people start promising what it's going to do, and then people start reiterating those promises, and we think that it's going to evolve exponentially in the first 24, 36 months of a platform being out there. So I think I think that. What's exciting, as I said, is when we started in the space, it was more of a novelty. You know, the people were kind of trying to just do quick test and learns. Uh, there was a flood of brands into voice, and then it got quiet for a little bit of time. I'd say early, you know, last year, late last year. And then all of the platforms have started releasing feature sets and dev tools that I think finally allow us to kind of take control of the platform into our own hands, where we can now build really robust programs and we have this adage that is like voice is not a project voice is a program and we can finally build really exciting programs where you can you know link into a voice experience and then shoot out from a voice experience into another channel mm -hmm. so i think to to where sci-fi has told us that we would be we're short i think we're in a really exciting awkward adolescence right now where we can kind of see what we will be able to do and we have to like push through um, but we're definitely going to be waiting on the platforms for, I think, a number of years before that, that full promise of like super fluid conversation um, is here. But there's a lot you can do now. Uh, fair enough. Are, are there certain use cases you see are more effective right now for voice channels uh, with other than the companies that you guys are working with? Um, yeah, absolutely. I think like in, in the companies or in the experiences that I've seen that work best are the ones that really leverage multimodality. So those are the ones that, like the way that Brandon just described shooting from one platform. Things, um, companies that are able to use voice as your input and your command line 
and be able to display information instantaneously. So whether that is like looking for directions, ordering single line commands, um, being able to interact with your devices where you're having kind of some of these preset routine or questions. So I think like they've done a really good job at building habit. And we've seen companies that do that really well that have really excelled like Calm or like Headspace, things like that. Um, and then you also see voice commerce really taking off where people are starting You still there? We're frozen. I can I can pick up until Emily yeah. un, unfreezes. But um, everything she was saying is is great. So I can just kind of continue the yeah. conversation. I agree. I think it's um, habit based utility has proven time and time again to work really really well. You know, one of the most successful experiences that we've built for a partner is is all recipes for Meredith Corporation. And that's habit based utility, and it by far has the highest organic usage right so habit-based utility i think if you look at the space um you know interactive entertainment stories games that's got a lot of traction early and, and both platforms are doubling down and reinvesting in um, games and interactive storytelling um you know for us i think we determine a kpi based on the user some of our clients really just want to capture data you know, they don't care about having millions of unique visits. They want really rich data from each session. So, you know, uh, voice is really powerful at, at leveraging or capturing data. It's really powerful at generating a lot of traffic. Um, and to what Emily was saying, I think commerce is also a really exciting area to grow in because you finally have all these tool sets that you can build a real commerce experience. So for us, it's about determining what the, the KPIs are for the, the brand itself and then figuring out how do you mix those tool sets up to, uh, to achieve it. That's great. Yeah, Emily, you're, you're just about to talk about commerce when it froze up. Uh, Brandon it was echoing a lot of your, the yeah, same. Yeah, uh, I, my, my internet yeah. has been so bad <laughs> over yeah. the past few weeks. So I apologize. I could hear you guys, but I was, I was frozen in time. <laughs> oh, okay, fair enough. Yeah, just see if you want to add anything. We talked a little bit about uh, habit forming utilities, the uh, interactive games and entertainment, and then uh, a little bit of the commerce. Um, are there any other ones you might yeah, want to add? Or those? I, I think, like lastly, like also in education. Um, okay. I, I think really what I've also seen is people who've done a really brilliant job at making like capsules and ways that people can consume other ways of education. I'm like really looking forward to and waiting for the opportunity for companies like Duolingo or companies like Rosetta Stone to mm -hmm. like hop on the train of how can we actually teach um, how people can well learn languages but orally um, since it's a lot more natural. Um, I think that there are a lot of new use cases that are coming in there, and I've even seen um, more recently on LinkedIn, which was like a, a I guess like a fun point for me, but one of my old professors from my university way back when. Uh, teaches sales there, and he actually built a uh, a cold calling bot uh, to give to all of his students. So then that way they can practice. What does it feel like to to go through that? To go down the different avenues of trying to convince somebody who might sometimes feel like a robot. So uh, I think that there's lots of avenues there, um, and especially as we start to incorporate more NLUs that are more common for different uh, jargon or different accents that will only expand. And Art, if I can add one more thing, I think like when we talk to clients, whether they're consumer facing or enterprise, one of the first things that we try and break a little bit when we start going into education is everyone thinks about voice as I need to make this skill or action or capsule and all my hopes and dreams need to be dropped into this one thing. And for us, it's really important to remember that you're going to have, you're going to be investing in voice, but it doesn't have to, you don't have to take everything your brand does and fit it into this basket. Voice can be just a really valuable touch point in your consumer or user or guest journey. So if you jump out to voice just to grab a phone number or just to do a survey or just to do some training, and then you push people back onto another channel that's more valuable for that interaction, people should think about the, the multimodality, the omni-channel nature of voice. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be an all-in-one use case. It could be an element of a use case, uh, which is a key piece.
Yeah, definitely. I mean, you guys are both chatting about that a bit, the uh, multimodal screens. Um, you just reminded me something on the education side. I remember we chatted with folks at Skype ages ago where they were building um, an experience where you could sort of practice uh, job interviews uh, similar to that cold call was kind of interesting. But on that multimodal note, sometimes we hear folks in the industry talk about, you know, voice first and voice first strategy. I mean, what does that mean to both of you guys? Because like, I see people or hear people interpret it differently. And especially because we're talking about multimodal, um, do you, well, first, do you, do you go along with, do you believe there's like a voice first strategy? And if, if you, what does that mean to you if you do? Uh, my, my thing is like, when we talk with people, we say, uh, do you have a voice device in your house? Uh, if yes, when is the last time that you pulled your phone out of your pocket to check the weather, set a timer, ask a general question, right? There's certain utilities that are going to become voice first, right? Like there should be really great weather experiences. There should be really phenomenal timers and calculators and news experience, things that people just don't want to take their phone out of their pocket for. But generally speaking, I think it's a good tagline. I think that's cool. Um, but I think about it in the way of we think about mobile first. And that it doesn't mean your whole business lives on mobile. It just means you need to be considerate of when your brand goes to mobile. And sometimes it's easier to design mobile first and then backtrack into your web experience. So we say like, we talk to a lot of enterprises who are building like all new IT infrastructures. And we say, well, think about it from a voice first perspective first so that you can build the pipes into your new website and mobile application so that it syncs really well with your voice experiences even if your voice experiences are gonna be invested in later on. So I, I like that voice first puts voice first, but it doesn't have to be everything. It, it needs to be a part of an ecosystem. Yeah, like I, I think that th there's always this debate on like voice only versus voice first. I think like definitely when voice first came out, everyone was like, ah, I will build voice only and that will be the only way that I will interact with this channel. We very quickly learned that was not the only option and that's kind of where voice first came from where voice is kind of that initial interaction with voice, um, but doesn't necessarily mean that it ends there. Um, and I think that there's going to be, I think we, we kind of live in like one line command land right now with voice where it's like, we say one thing, we get what we want. We're like, okay, cool. On to the next thing. Um, and that, that was exactly how we interact with everything in the past where it's one simple function. It does it really well or sometimes really well and um, we move on and, and hope that that's kind of what it looks like. But where we're really pushing with it and what I like about voice first is that it's changing the conversation about how we think about inputs or how we think about commands, where it could be if you think about your movement in your routine where you wake up in the morning and you start maybe by asking about the weather, but then you move into your kitchen and you're logged into all your devices and it knows where your voice is. And you say, okay, like, what do I have in my fridge? Or like, okay, cool, reorder that thing for me. Um, what's my schedule? And it's being able to jump through all of those different things that if you were to map that side by side with all the actions that you need to take on your phone or on your laptop or all those things, that's when you start to identify what could be all of these new inputs that take up in your experience. And I think like that's the voice first mentality that I, I really like that comes out of that conversation. Um, and would definitely like challenge more people to think about if you were to put it up against actually performing that action in the way that you do it right now, which one takes longer, which one actually is easier. And I, I think a good example to think about in your head when you go through this, I always use like the Uber example, but like Uber first launched on Alexa to order, um, to order rides. Um, and the issue was didn't get a lot of usage because people would normally order Ubers to come home, not to leave home. And all the devices are plugged into the wall. So like there was a mismatch there on what actually would be used, what actually was in the context of what you were building versus had they launched with like Uber Eats and like just their ice cream truck promotion as an example. So there's like lots of ways that you can think about that differently. And I like how voice first frames that conversation. Yeah, I like that example. Uh, it's, it's it's yeah, it's it's great. So it's not a voice only, but you know, keeping voice in mind um, yeah. uh, as one of the modalities. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, perhaps, uh, how do folks? Um, how do the people get uh, these enterprise brands get started? And uh, uh, we talked a little bit about the context and the modality, but how do you get started building a voice? Um, uh, 
a skill or interface? What, what are some good recommendations or tips that people should think about? So for, for us, like this is, I get pretty excited about this because I think that, um, you know, a big part of our business is we say that we, we're a creative agency, right? We, we really try and design user centric, you know, uh, insight focused strategic experiences. So we always try and start from an education first. So if a, if a partner of ours has the time and the resource resource to go through like an education or a white paper or a research initiative, we always do that first because whatever you think your voice experience might be after going through some research, education, workshopping, you always have an insight of like, oh, we, we were in the right room, but we were like two degrees off. So if, if you have the ability to go through uh, an educational program or a, a research period, whether internally or with an agency partner, you know, please do that. Because if you start with your, your shoulders kind of squared with a base of education, you can think more creatively and more broadly knowing what's feasible in the platform. If you don't have that time and resource, then we say, have your idea, go build it, right? You can use a platform like Emily has, or you can work with an agency like us or some combination, go build it. But then for us, the most exciting part is get that thing live and then track analytics for four, five, six weeks. And your biggest education is gonna be from looking at those analytics after launch and then making sure you've allocated resources to iterate that experience. Um, after live. So both ends are education. One's like learn by doing and the other is learn by taking time to learn. Awesome. Yeah, no, I, I definitely think that we're in the stage where everyone's learning. Like there, there's yeah. definitely people that you can go and be like, oh, that was really cool. That was really well done. Take note of it. Like I, I think in the same way that people who are constantly iterating on like ads, websites, like products, like you're constantly saving videos and screens things like that and you file them away and you hope that you'll look at them someday. Sometimes you do. Um, and I, I think that with voice is the same, like you, you need to do a combination of thinking through um, what is it that you could potentially build in the first place. And I think that tools like ours, I think agencies, I think there's a ton of workshops that are available that you can go and learn from. Um, I'm obviously very biased because I work on a build tool and I see people sharing what they build all the time in our groups. So like I'm always build first and try to try to create something out of your head. Don't try to create the thing that's your end product. Try to create with the sense of just trying to understand how the thing works um, and start to learn from that because it's going to help you build technical empathy on what's possible on that platform, which I think is something that a lot of people will forget when they start to scope out a project. And it so quickly balloons into what they think will be the end results and what they assume that will interact with. So my my biggest suggestion would be like go on YouTube, talk to talk to people in the industry, find a Facebook group like ours, or like there's a bunch of different forums and interact with people and ask how they learned. Because there's not a lot of documentation that's gonna be super relevant for exactly what you're looking for. It's gonna come from what are you trying to build, what are you trying to get out of it? Yeah, it's fair. I, I think there's a big part of it too is the why, like why building this interface uh, in addition to what. I, I think one of the things we, you know we see we, folks are talking about with any new interface, this things take some time. The, the other thing that often happens is folks try to take whatever they did in the previous interface and jam it into the new interface, and those things uh, don't always work. Like taking your FAQs and putting it into a chat bot or, or into a voice skill. Uh, might not translate that well. Um, so w w one thing uh, w with voice experiences, we, uh, so there's a, I, I talked to someone once before, they, they made an interesting point where with brands, there's certain things that stand out about them. Like if you see, you know, red and yellow, you know, that's McDonald's kind of thing. Like with voice experiences, how do enterprises and brand, brands convey their, their brand? Like w what are some tips that you, you all might have for that. Yeah, we, we do a lot of work on this and I, uh, it's like I'm, sonic identity is very important. So we, we always go through an exercise of what's the tone of the brand and what sound effects are we going to use and what music are we going to produce and who's the voiceover, you know, actress or actor or whoever it may be who's going to be voicing this over. Um, all of that is really important. Uh, but I think like before you get even get into 
brand presence. It's like, is your user, is the use case right? So your brand can't shine unless you have the right use case. So I just want to say, like, get the use case right. Make sure you're building, you know, something that's good. And then make sure you, you skin it with the right branding. But um, the platforms make it easy. You can, anything you do on a website or mobile application, you can do in voice. Great, great audio, great video, great visuals. Um, just give yourself the time and the resource to, to, to build it and, and iterate based on how you see people interacting with it. Yeah, like I think that creating what your voice, uh, what your brand sounds like is something that I think we have seen really mature over the last decade in marketing. Like the fact that you can think about like Wendy's and then you know exactly what she looks like as a logo. And then you think about how they interact on Twitter and you're like, oh, like she's kind of sassy and funny versus like Bank of America, probably not funny on Twitter, but like useful. Um, so, so thinking about kind of like what that personality looks like and even thinking about what are some of the iconic ways that brands do that even now? Like I always think about like Dos Equis as a brand, like it's the most interesting man in the world and he's tied to a beer and I know exactly what he sounds like. Like I can picture him, um, when I think about the beer, um, in the same way that like Morgan Friedman's voice is iconic. So trying to think through and think about what are some of those examples that you can bring into your brand and think about in the same way that you have brand guidelines that starts with how do you talk? What's your copy? Are you conversational? What are your greetings? How do you interact with people? Um, and then builds into that next layer of like, okay, what does it sound like? What are the ear cons? So the small bits of music that you use to, to trigger people in the same way that, um, whenever you hear an iPhone ring in a movie, you're triggered. Like those small things are ways that you can start to build your brand into that recognition state that I think we're more used to visually. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's fair. I just curious, one thing we've been talking a bit about uh, a little bit more effectively with the Alexa, Google Assistant kind of interactions. Are, are either of you working on custom voice interactions, maybe it's IVR or, or, or voice interfaces for different types of interfaces. Just curious and if, how, how you might see those going. Yeah. yeah, we get really excited about, we say voice is a channel in the sense of you have Amazon and Google and Samsung and a couple others, yeah. but it's also a user interface. So we're, we're working on several projects right mm -hmm. now where it's about, yeah, creating a, an app for the channel, but also how do we voice activate your mobile app? How do we voice activate your website? And for some of those, there's incredible partners like SoundHound or Jovo. Google just released Google App Actions. Um, we've also worked with Lex to build like custom hardware and kiosks that are voice activated. So for us, it's not about what type of an Alexa scale should we make. It's, it's where does voice as an interface benefit our organization? And then we determine the right platform for it. Um, but there's a lot of exciting channels out there right now. Yeah, like I think that I, we've seen so much, like so much from, um, I think like you have to think about in the same way that you do like principal designing or principal development versus outward development. Um, there's going to be ways that people are now ability into their pre-existing channels. So like web embeds, chats, um, just voice accessibility in general, like voice navigation will soon be a thing in a lot of places. And then I think on the opposite side to your point on like IVRs or kind of pre-existing voice channels that have kind of been around for a while. And for those of you who aren't familiar with IVRs, they're the not fun things that you hit when you call your bank or like when you are really mad normally on the phone, you get hit with an IVR. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I think where voice is going in with this is now starting to pick up other smarter things. So like tonality or taking something that used to be like this branch of a data tree of like ask them 10 questions to get to the right department and often it's wrong versus boiling that back down to how, like, how can I help you today? And them listening for user intents versus actually defining the, ten the intents like buttons. So I think that there's a lot of changes there. And when we work mostly in IVR, it's really that. It's trying to make that simpler, trying to make it smarter in terms of, um, in terms of what are the options that the user can drive? And then how can we make sure all the iterations and revisions are in one spot? Yeah, definitely. That's, that's one of the great things about these conversational interfaces, not just voice, but chat. The users are really telling you, or they can tell you what they want um, in a weird way. They help drive uh, 
product. It's, it's not, there's only so many buttons and links you can click on a website or mobile app, but through these interfaces, people can say, I, I want exactly this, or this is what I, what I need. And then they tell you what they think of it after if you don't you know, give the right answer back or what they're looking for. Um, I guess a, a, a somewhat related qu question to this is just in generally user adoption or, or awareness. Um, I, I know we, at the beginning, we were talking a little bit about some of the, the platforms have been making improvements with tools and all, which is helpful. There's still some need around that user acquisition. Um, are there some tips that you might have for folks for how they can help get their voice experiences discovered or increase yeah, activity? Yeah, for, for us, it, it's a couple things. It's a thing I said before, it's, you know, voice is a program, not a project. So when you're designing your project, make sure you're thinking about how are we bringing this to market, right? Are we leveraging our own channels? Are we grabbing a piece of our media budget? Are we leveraging social channels, whatever it may be? So you got to think about a sustained distribution of your experience to make sure that you give it time to grow. There are some things you do on the platforms that can assure you get better visibility. If you have a relationship with the platforms through maybe advertising, reach out, leverage those networks. The platforms can help you to promote through like co-marketing. And then for us, a lot of it's about retargeting. So can we grab your phone number? Can we grab your email address? And then do we not just sit on your phone number in a database, but do we text you? Do we send you notifications on the device? Do we remind you that it's time to come back? Do we give you some kind of a, of a reason or a call to action to return? So. Make sure you have a sustained program plan and then figure out how you can retarget people because you got to remind them to, to come back. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I think uh, we're, we're definitely not at the stage where we're comfortable with our with our voice devices casually giving us notifications. Um, I, I think that we're definitely far away from that. It would definitely be scary right now. Um, but um, I, I think in, in terms of kind of two prongs, like with discoverability, if you are, if you have a budget, if you have existing distribution channels, leverage that. Like to Brandon's point, it should be part of your go-to-market strategy, um, especially if you're approaching it from I'm a business and I want to prove out this channel. Um, in terms of like creators, designers, developers starting their own thing or getting early traction, like try to think about what are the other platforms where people are searching for these things. There's I've seen really good success from people leveraging YouTube videos and promoting that. Um, I've seen great traction on using forums for cross-platform syndication or trying to do some form of retargeting on a, web, on a website that has just an email capture. So you can remind them that way. So there's lower budget ways of doing it as much as there are higher budget ways of doing it um, if you have those resources. But I think like anything that you launch for new, always think about what's that wait list? What's that audience? How can you target them? How can you make sure that they know what you're working on? Yeah, I like that. And giving them the reason to come back too, like not just retargeting them, but yeah, make them want to come back and all that. That's that's great. Yeah. Um, just looking at the time, maybe, well, first I appreciate that, if I haven't said it before, I appreciate you guys being part of this. Um, how about, just uh, are there, just then to wrap it up is, uh, are there any predictions that you might have for the, like, right the end of the year, any predictions you have for this coming year um, what do you think might happen or what you might hope might happen in the voice space for 2021? You know, hopefully COVID goes down. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll just quickly, like I, as I said, I think all the tools are there now to make some really exciting voice programs. Um, my hope is that we have a flood. We always say that we're, we want the most creative minds to join us to build the best voice experiences in the world. And I'm excited about more brands and more agencies and more people getting involved that have resources and, and true like program creativity to build really exciting channel shifting experiences. I think once we make those really compelling experiences, then people go, okay, yeah, that's worth using. And I think that this channel is really worth you know, using for that purpose. So we're really excited about you know, larger brands and organizations investing in the channel, getting really creative, building programs, um, and hopefully that creates some momentum, but uh, everything we need is here. People just have got to get in here and, and start building. Yeah, like I think that like from, from the business side, I am beyond excited for people to re-up their budgets in <laughs> 2021 <laughs> and probably launch a lot of things that um, might be a little bit short of Q4. 
I think that there's there's a ton that companies tend to have lock and loaded ready to go for Q1. So as a marketer and someone in growth, I'm always excited for January. Um, it's like business Christmas. Um, and then uh, as kind of creators, I think what's really exciting, what I hope happens over, over the break is that surge of just having that renewed sense of I want to try something new. I want to pick up this new device that someone bought me and I want to figure out what to do with it. Um, and we always see a spike in new people trying out new things, launching more things, trying out or sharing their experiences. And I, I hope with the surge on what we've seen with some of the teasers from Alexa and teasers from Google, that there's going to be a surge of new devices to think about as well. Um, and I hope that some of that, multi that multi-modality piece can become more accessible and more embedded in, uh, in more platforms. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the future as well. I, I, there was a panelist that had years ago, I, I, it, he had mentioned, um, you know, when you look at movies, what, what first happened is people would just take the play, you know, you are going to play and he's now filming it and, and all that. And he said, it, it, a lot of this voice is, experiences is very similar. Um, we, we haven't maybe fully taken advantage of the interface and the platform. And it would be interesting to see, as you guys have mentioned, more creative people getting involved that, that really uh, play around with those and what, what um, experiences come out of that would be pretty exciting. Um, I appreciate you guys being part of this. Uh, Stefan, I don't know if you're still listening, if there's questions from any of the folks. Uh, um, yeah, I'm here. I've, I've been listening the whole time. Um, looks like he's trying. Yeah, uh, Ardy, you could look at the stage and see if, uh, I know there's a, a couple of questions um, that are here, but Brandon, I, I actually had a question for you uh, as well. You, you mentioned earlier that uh, brands could really take advantage of uh, the multimodality of it, where let's say you have a course or some sort of piece of content, uh, you could leverage voice where you interact with the customer in some way, and then it takes them to the proper channel later on. Yeah. Uh, how would that work? So there's there's a ton of features. This, is, this comes to like the education oh. piece. Let's take Amazon, for example. There's something called a quick link, which you can hyperlink from one of your channels into voice. Okay. Then when you're in voice, you can capture someone's phone mm -hmm. number. Then you can take that phone number, drop it in the Twilio, send them a text message, which sends them out to one of your other channels. Or you can actually link to your app, your mobile application if you have a mobile app that you want to send people to. So the whole ecosystem is doable now. It's just connecting those dots. Uh, it's a really exciting time to be, to be building these, these projects. Yeah, that does sound very exciting. So, um, for example, let's say that what would the trigger be? Would it be like me asking Google, let's use a really bad example. Uh, I can't <laughs> think of a good one. Hey, Google, who's Tom Brady? Right? Sure. And and then maybe you know as a developer that you know maybe you sell Tom Brady jerseys, um, or some sort of Tom Brady content. Uh, walk yeah. me through the next steps. Like what what could happen from there? In a universe where Amazon or Google doesn't already tell you who Tom Brady is from uh, a first right. party perspective, let's say that you've isolated a question that you you see real estate to capture. You could turn on uh -huh. uh, a name for you. You could turn on like an SEO tool. It's called Name Free Invocation, right. which should should recommend mm -hmm. your experience as the answer to that. Once you're in the experience, say, right. hey, Tom Brady is a great quarterback. He's a champion. Do you want the TB12 mm -hmm. t-shirt? It's on sale right now. Give me your phone number and I'll text you a coupon code. Um, that's mm -hmm. easy to do today. Uh, give me your e you know, We captured your email address through permissions. We just sent you an offer. Um, a QR code mm -hmm. in an ad that sends you into a voice experience. Uh, we could talk about this for hours, but I'm sure maybe there's another question. It, it's all there. This is why like, digging around yeah. and doing some research is, is required to figure out how to connect all those dots. But everything you need is there right now in DevTools. Yeah, that's very yeah. exciting. So, Ardy, have you seen oh, any good uh, questions? Let me just see here. I, I, there's some definitely some comments in here of like, folks uh, liking what was said. I'm looking for your questions. Oh, one person was asking where to find that cold call uh, practice bot you're mentioning, Emily. Uh, uh, just looking here. Uh, here's one from Marvin. How do you deal with the early experience that users made already that Brandon, the voice assistant, as quote unquote dumb? 
are these experiences uh, bad or threatening? Uh, have they already lowered trust? Well, I mean, that's interesting. Uh, it just if you think of mobile apps, some of the first apps were the silly <laughs> things like, you know, um, it's, it's uh -huh. I think yeah. people said the fart apps, that there was that kind of stuff happening in, yeah. in, in voice. Um, I don't know, but, uh, Brandon and Emily can chime in on this, but I think I wouldn't say we would necessarily, like, I would like to think we're beyond that, like folks are doing more interesting stuff now. Yeah, like I, I think like anything, you're always at risk of potentially potentially screwing up. Mm -hmm. um, like even when you launch a product for the first time on a web app or on mobile apps, there's, there's always room for that. You kind of always expect that there's that margin of error. And ultimately, like there are ways that you can mitigate it. Like I always recommend cohorting and trying to do small batch tests until you're ready to roll things out and really focus, especially in the early stages, should be on user feedback and should be on uh, getting what are the results, what are the drop-offs um, that are possibly uh, gonna be present there and work through those before you do a large scale. And, and I think that on, on the brand side and really what, um, on the brand side and really looking at other things, you should also be thinking about how your brand can also create a potential moat for that. Like, one of the big things that we always do mm -hmm. is we make it really at the forefront that we talk to all of our customers, we hear those feedbacks. So when we potentially screw up, there's a little bit of room for <laughs> a little bit of room for error that we could potentially bounce back. I see. And uh, well, let's do one last question. Um, because lunch is upon us, and I know people are thinking about lunch already. But um, do you see any roadmap in which voice flow projects could be deployed to other platforms? Um, absolutely. Um, I can 100% say absolutely. Okay. Um, right now, um, we're we're kind of the React native for Google and Alexa, where you can build wow. once, you can deploy twice. Um, in very, very soon, not to get ahead of itself, um, you will be able to see that in a lot more ways. Um, and for opening mm -hmm. that up to a lot more platforms. So, so definitely stay tuned. And we want to continue that, that idea where we, we build once and we have those, uh, we have platform based on which one of the channels you choose. That's, that's perfect. Uh, any last words? Uh, my message is always, uh, the same. It's like, like we're, we're trying to build like the biggest, boldest, most successful voice experiences for our partners. So if there's people here that are uh, wanting to get into voice or you're a creative or you get in there, we're looking for people to always collaborate with. If you're a brand that's trying to figure out how to build a voice program, uh, wherever you are in the process, please uh, please reach out. We're, we're, we're obsessed with the space and, and love working in it. Absolutely. I think like, yeah, on, great. On side, same. Um, we're here to talk. I think that everyone in the community is super excited to engage with each other. So if anything, like take the rest of this really weird year and think through what are ways that when we get back, things can be better. And what are those experiences that are gonna be there? I think that as much as stuff's been really weird this year, uh, it's also opened up a ton of opportunity mm -hmm. to rethink what does re-entering um, what does re-entering um, the world look like after on? Our elevator is going to be voice interacted. Our drive through is going to be more common. Are people willing to touch mm -hmm. random touch screens at McDonald's anymore? Who knows? So <laughs> thinking through and being ahead of that, I think, would be a really great place to start. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I, I'm excited to see what folks do uh, in voice beyond um, these devices, exactly what Emily was just mentioning, being able to call the elevator, use your ATM, those kind of things would be quite interesting. Um, and so it, definitely excited to see what the future has in store. And uh, once again, I appreciate the opportunity to be uh, part of this with, with all of you. It was, uh, it was definitely interesting. Awesome. And what's the best way to follow you guys or if uh, the audience wants to uh, have a conversation or follow up? And will you be here for happy hour? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're we're on all, all social channels at Skip Creative. Uh, please, please reach out. We love talking about voice with voice people or non-voice people. So at Skill Creative. Yeah, I think uh, on my end, um, definitely chat with us on Twitter. We're super responsive. Um, I'm at Emily Lanetto. I'm also one of the two people behind at Voice Flow HQ. So. Either one of them, you'll probably end up talking to me. Um, so feel free to shoot us a message there. I'd be happy to chat. 
And then I'm already married on LinkedIn and Twitter. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. And uh, we'll see you Thanks soon. Thanks a lot. Thank Thanks. you. Bye.